you guys for showing up. This is a hot topic. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk about short-term rentals. Um, that's kind of my thing. That's what I specialize in. Um, so Savannah, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hey everyone, um, I'm Savannah. I am a registered nurse. I actually just recently stepped down from full-time to per diem and that is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so thankful. Uh, uh, that's mainly due to my investing in multifamily syndication. So um, started investing in the beginning of 2020. My husband and I started in long-term rentals, just buy and hold strategy, and we really wanted to scale a lot quicker. So we discovered multifamily syndications, uh, really wanted to create a business. Oh no, you cut off your audio. So now I'm doing that. I do multifamily syndication, started this uh, Facebook group with Alex, really just to share resources with other people. We noticed that there's a lot of other healthcare professionals that are super interested in investing in real estate and doing all sorts of different strategies, people sharing resources and using different techniques to build wealth and kind of offset some W-2 income. So super motivated by it and happy to be here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we created that Facebook group. And actually, one of my, my ultimate goal is 10,000. Uh, and we're the first step is 1000 people. So within two months or so, I don't know, maybe three months, we're up to like 950 or something crazy like that. And actually, um, uh, Jonas is actually on this call in San Francisco. Uh, he was actually uh, really integral there. He, he passed it along and shared it to a bunch of people. And we got a lot of PTs, OTs um, coming along. Um, so we're just here to try to build a community and help each other out. So guys, um, if you could do me a favor, go into your name and hit those three dots. And what I want you to do is I want you to put your name or whatever you want to be called and then put the city you're, uh, you're, you're from. We have people from all, all over. I know my, my boy Lenny is uh, East Coast, but sometimes we got people like all the way from Hawaii. And sometimes we've, we had someone from Hong Kong. So we can have uh, the, these meetups are pretty crazy how, you know, there's uh, people from all over. So you never know. Uh, you might meet someone in the city that you're living living in right now. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Full, full screen? Yep. Yes. All right. Let's see. I hope this works. So financial freedom, in, investing in short-term rentals. This is actually a picture I took. It's in Gatlinburg. Uh, it's on top of this like skywalk bridge or something like that. But this is uh, the area I invest in. I invest in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Um, and there are definitely other areas. Oh, why can't I play it? Okay, there we go. So about me, in case you don't know, uh, that's the same damn picture. I need a better picture. I only have one picture. So my name is Alex Sabio, married father of four. I do have a W-2 job. I'm a respiratory therapist. I've been doing that since 2002, hopefully not too much longer. I'm looking to retire here in a little bit. I've been investing in real estate since 2004. To be honest, guys, I wish I had a better story. I hear podcasts where there's guys that have like blown up and they have a hundred rentals like within the first year and they're making, you know, millions or whatever. That's not really my story. I am like your average Joe that started investing and made a ton of mistakes along the way um, and learned from them. You know, um, I, I was affected by 2008, just like everyone else. I had a foreclosure and a bankruptcy and I fell hard, you know, and um, had tons of negative cash flowing assets. And at a certain point, um, I had all of this knowledge and I wanted to get back into real estate. Most of my investments are out of state. I've invested in North Carolina, Colorado, California, Ohio, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, um, so I've also invested in multifamily syndications, and now I focus all on short-term rentals right now. Uh, some of my goals with um, uh, investing, this is actually a picture of my family in front of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, I'm not sure who that is. I need to meet them. Um, the goal is to build generational wealth, create passive income that exceeds my W-2. Uh, inspire others and take others along with me. Really, if I did anything to help you guys out, 
I don't, I never ask for a dime from you guys. The one thing I ask you guys is like, um, just let me know. Like you start making so many, let me know. Cause that gets me really pumped up. Give me a shout out on social media. Say, Hey, you know, this will help me out, get a short-term rental or get a long-term rental, whatever it is. Uh, Cause like I said, that gives me motivation. And the one thing I ask you to do is I want you to take someone else along with you. Show someone else the business. Okay. Personal goals and challenges. I love to hike. This is a picture of me on top of uh, a mountain. So, um, this is me at Havasupai with my wife. This is me at Yosemite climbing half dome. This is me at Iron Mountain. I don't know who that is. That's not muted. Let me see. There you go. Hopefully, I found him. Uh, this is me, I don't know, hiking in the snow somewhere. This is me in Zion National Park in the snow, uh, Angels Landing. This is me, Cucamonga Peak on top of the clouds. This is me somewhere in San Diego. Uh, this is a picture of my wife and I. We climbed uh, the tallest peak in the lower 48 states, uh, Mount Whitney. Um, and the ultimate goal is actually uh, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, I keep putting that off. It's going to take me anywhere from six to nine days. It's the tallest peak in Africa. Um, really, I want to invest so I could do cool things like this. You know, this is, I, I want to have more time off so I could just, you know, pursue my passions a little bit more. So short-term rentals, STR. So why short-term rentals? Um, to me, it's the new way of investing. Um, if this were a stock market, I would say long-term rentals is like investing in like, um, oh man, I'm getting tons of background. You guys make... All right, I think I got a crazy dog in the background. I hope everyone's okay. <laughs> so anyway, a new way. So to me, investing in real estate is like uh, investing in Bitcoin. Like this thing is insane, man. The amount of profits we're getting is insane. I keep telling people about it, but they don't understand. But you know, that's why I do these presentations. Uh, so much more cash flow than long-term rentals. In general, you could expect about two to three times more cash flow um, from short-term rental than long-term rental. So let's say your house is renting for fifteen hundred dollars uh, a month. You could probably put it as a short-term rental on Airbnb and generate about three thousand to forty-five hundred dollars. Now, there's so many other factors there, right? Um, you could achieve financial freedom with less doors. Uh, when I was investing in long-term rentals, those things, they would profit probably two, $300 a month for me to get to my goals. Um, my goal is about 20 to $25,000 a month. I would probably need like a hundred of those things. And, and that's if they're all rented and there's no evictions and, and no problems, right? And so I'd probably need 150 of them to get there. With me, with short-term rentals, I get to that number with four cabins you know, much easier to get to. Um, it's a lot more fun. You know, I, I, this is a picture of my cabin. This is the first cabin I bought. Um, they're in destination markets. I get to use them and enjoy, um, enjoy the cabins with my family. You know, they're cool places to visit. Federico is my realtor out there in Cleveland. And I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. I never, ever wanted to visit Cleveland. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, and those, ca you know, they were cash flowing nice, but I never wanted to go visit them. And I never did. I actually owned them, sold them, um, never visited them. Um, there's no more, you know, tenant rights. We don't have to deal with that. Uh, and there's no rent control. I don't have to deal with that either. All right. So who should stay away from short-term rentals? Short-term rentals are amazing, but it's not for everyone, man. So right here, here's a picture of my pool. I have an indoor pool. That damn guest, there was a guest that poured bubble bath inside my pool. I don't know who does that crap, man. And so it's really not for the faint of heart. It will drive you nuts. So really, um, short-term rentals are for people who can't so solve problems. You're going to have problems left and right. You're just going to have to pivot and, and, and figure out a solution. Sometimes people freak out right away. So if you freak out, this isn't for you you're going to have tons of freak out moment, moments. And so just stay calm and don't panic. Uh, don't take things too personal. I think people, uh, you know, have personal things inside and they're like, oh, I built that, um, that bed up and now someone damaged it. It's just the cost of doing business for me. Um, and you got to be uncomfortable with things being variable. Like right now I have no bookings in January. 
And I'm okay with that. Like if I had those 150 long-term rentals, I'd probably have 120 of them with a long-term lease and you have that comfort. So with short-term rental, you're sacrificing a little bit of comfort, um, you know, um, for a little bit more, actually a lot more profit. Um, people who should stay away from this are people that don't take the responsibility. Like this is one example I give all the time. Like guests would contact me all the time and say, hey, what is the Wi-Fi password? And it's really easy to just pass that on as, oh, those stupid ass guests, they don't know what they're talking about. I sent them the message. But what you want to start doing is start putting the blame on yourself. And for me, when, when I started doing that, that's when uh, business really started taking off. So I said, what am I doing wrong that, um, that these stupid ass guests are contacting me for the Wi-Fi password? So really, you have to try to um, be accountable, say, hey, what am I doing wrong? Um, and then you know, and, and like I said, I think your business will take off. So real estate versus hospitality. So the thing is, short-term rentals isn't even real estate, to tell you the truth. You're more in the hospitality industry. You're more in, it's more of a business than it is real estate. And really, I'm going to break it down even more. It's a people business. I think people always ask me, what systems do you have in place? Um, you know, what, uh, what cameras do you have in place? What uh, doorbells do you have in place? To be honest with you, the most important thing are the relationships you build in this business. Do you have an amazing relationship with the realtor? Do you have an amazing relationship with the lender so you could do another deal? Do you have amazing relationship with your cleaner? That actually, when you focus in on those things, you're going to go really far versus the, the systems will figure themselves out, to tell you the truth. I mean, you'll have systems and you can easily replace them, but we, we all worry about the systems that, that we're going to put in place. So focus in on relationships. So how do you stack the deck in your favor? Uh, I do have a formula that I like to, to uh, um, go by uh, for choosing a, the right short-term rental. So I like to invest in short-term rental friendly markets, uh, vacation destination with lots of visitors. And really I should change that to tons of visitors. When there's tons of visitors, supply and demand are heavily in your favor. And then you could just charge an arm and a leg at that point. I like to invest in areas with low taxes and where the utilities are, are cheaper uh, to, to pay for. Uh, let me see if I can find that person. I don't know who's, I need to mute someone. I don't know who it is. Alex, make me a co-host and I can help you mute people. Oh, okay. I don't know how to do that. Sorry. Uh, Disable. No, we'll just keep going here. Sorry. Um, uh, I, I like areas with boots on the ground and I need to, I need it to cash flow like crazy. Sorry, guys. I get distracted way easy. So to me, if I could find those, all five of those things, I go all in, I go all in hard. And at the end of the day, if I lose the hand, I'm cool with it. It's like having a pair of aces and you lost the hand and you went all in. To me, I'm okay with that. Uh, short-term uh, short rental uh, friendly, don't buy in areas where it's not short-term rental friendly. I mean, it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, people don't want to live next to an Airbnb. That's really what it comes down to. People are going to call the cops and it's going to make your life miserable. You could choose HOA versus non-HOA. There are different HOA areas where they do allow Airbnbs, but just look into that. Um, I try to stay out of hotel dominant markets just because that's the thing to do, right? Like I'm here in Southern California and Las Vegas is very hotel dominant. Tons of visitors, but it's hotel dominant. I think you know, for that's not really the tradition to go to Las Vegas to rent out a, a Airbnb or a house. Um, cities that collect um, taxes on short-term rentals can be dependent on that income. Um, I like to invest in those areas because what will happen is um, they're very reluctant to shut you down. Um, Choose vacation destinations with lots of visitors. Supply and demand is, it, that's really what it is. Demand is going to drive up your, your prices and it's going to drive up your uh, occupancy. 
Um, here's actually a list of the most visited parks in 2019. This is from Wikipedia, so you guys could look that up. But here in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, okay, got 12 and a half million visitors. If I could choose areas, I would try to choose one of those areas that are most visited. These are the most visited national parks. Number one, the Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park, 12 and a half million visitors. Number two is the Grand Canyon at 6 million. I've been to the Grand Canyon and it's completely packed and Great Smoky Mountains blows it away by double. Uh, even Yellowstone, Yosemite, all of those. Yellow, look, Yellowstone's four million people. Uh, Yosemite is four and a half million people and that place is completely packed. Uh, so try to invest in areas that have a lot of visitors. I try to invest in areas with low taxes. Uh, these are uh, some states with no income tax. Uh, Tennessee is in yellow because they actually tax interest and dividends, and so is New Hampshire. Uh, so if I could invest in states with no income tax, I try to choose those. But I also try to I look at the property taxes too. Um, which states have the lowest property taxes? I think someone, a bunch of people contacted me about Texas, and I've owned homes in Texas. Property taxes are like three percent, man. I hate the property taxes in Texas. Uh, and actually, I'm in, I was in a newer subdivision, so it was more like three and a half percent. Um, so try to invest in areas with low property taxes. Um, we actually have a meetup next week uh, with uh, Ryan Back. It's uh, short-term uh, rental wealth through the tax code. Uh, it's Our meetups are every Monday. Um, and he's going to talk about the different loopholes that uh, you have. Um, last year, I paid zero in taxes, and that's because of one short-term rental. Now, I'm in this like crazy hamster wheel where I have to keep buying more short-term rentals to keep paying nothing in, in, in federal income tax. I got a $41,000 tax return. That was the largest tax return I got. Now, for me, I reinvest that and try to buy more short-term rentals, which gives me more tax breaks and gives me more cash flow. So poor me, right? Uh, I also do a cost segregation study on these things. Um, uh, this is Yona Wise. We're trying to get him on the show or, or the, um, the, the meetups, and he'll talk about cost segregation. Um, so that was one of the strategies that helped me uh, pay zero in taxes. Uh, boots on the ground, try to invest in areas with tons of boots on the ground. I have a buddy invested in Montana, and he told me there's like three cleaners in town. And I would hate to be him if he had to fire that cleaner. And I bet you they know each other. And so, you know, they, I'm sure they'd talk trash if he fired one of them. Um, so really you want to be in like a mature vacation market where there's tons of workers in the area. Like I said, it's a people business. You're only going to be successful uh, with, these, uh, with these cleaners and have lots of handymen in the area. Um, Facebook groups have been really big for me. What I do is I try to find different Facebook groups like um, with... Um, like clean, cleaners will have different Facebook groups and you can ask them for handyman and stuff like that. That's been really big for me. Um, you could definitely use a property manager for these short-term rentals. Uh, but what, I, what I'll tell you is you could do it yourself without using that property manager. Property managers generally will take on the low end 20%, on the high end like 40 to 45%. And even the if you try to get one like at 20%, what they do is they nickel and dime you to the point where you're gonna wind up paying 40%. And what will wind up happening is your revenue isn't gonna be anywhere near as good as if you self-manage. Uh, a buddy of mine, he just bought a short-term rental um, pretty much across the street from me. And he calls me up and he says, hey man, um, profits were amazing in July. It was like $8,000, this is amazing. And I said, oh shoot, my, my uh, gross income for July was $28,000. And we pretty much have the same exact cabin, like his cabin's actually bigger than mine as a theater room and everything and has a better view. And he only grossed $8,000. Whereas I generated like almost four times what he did. And it, it was because he was under property management. Um, so it must cash flow. What I like to do is I like to this is a statement I read. Um, if you have enough money to solve a problem, you don't have a problem. What will happen is you generate so much cash flow from these, it's really easy to solve problems. Whenever something breaks, you just replace it. No big deal. Um, if someone's unhappy, you give them a little bit of refund. No big deal because you're still generating so much income. Um, I do have a short-term rental calculator. Um, you guys could email me or text me um, your email. I'll send you the short-term rental calculator I created. What I like to do is I like to have a minimum of 20 to 25% cash on cash return. Uh, and on top of that, I like to have a minimum of $3,000 net profit every single, uh, on average. Um, 
And what you'll find is my deals, because I conservatively underwrote them, I'm performing around 50% cash on cash return with around the $5,000 a month net profit. So let's talk about the deal. So this is the deal. This is actually a picture of my wife in front of our first short-term rental ca uh, cabin. Um, she was actually able to retire from her W-2 job within three months of um, starting the short-term rental. So it was a four bedroom, three bath, 2,300 square feet. We bought it in the middle of the uh, pandemic, August, 2020, that's when we closed. We paid 625,000. Builder paid closing costs because at that time, nobody was buying homes. Um, it, this house actually sat on the market for over 40 days. Came with a hot tub, fully furnished, fully decorated. And in these vacation markets, um, they'll come fully furnished. The well, vast majority of them come fully furnished. Just because, think about it, who's owning homes in these vacation home markets? I mean, nobody's going to take a U-Haul and take all the furniture back. They're just going to sell the home as is. Um, brand new appliances, stainless steel appliances. We put about 18% down. That was a huge rookie mistake. Um, and that's mainly because I had a bankruptcy. I mean, I wasn't very good at this. If I had my finances in order, I would have gotten a better cash on cash return. It should have been 100%, to tell you the truth. Um, and we needed about $2,500 to set up. Not that much. It was more just setting up a camera and uh, like a door lock and then the owner's closet, little things here and there. This is actually a picture of your porter uh, of my finances. Um, this shows the first year uh, what I generated. Uh, we generated $132,000 and we kept about half of that as net profit. And we didn't even do a good job. When you first start up as a Airbnb host, you'll make tons of mistakes. Like you're, you're going to, I could tell you this right now, you're going to price too low. Uh, you're going to have bad pictures. You're going to have bad title and you're going to wind up giving people discounts when they ask for discounts. Um, and not only that, you're not a super host yet. So people are reluctant to start um, uh, booking with you at first. So. This is actually a picture of two cabins that we have under contract. So this is as of 2021. So the first cabin right now, if you look over here on the top, uh, it says $117,000. So that's how much bookings we have this year. And now mind you, we still have like uh, a week left in October. We have like November and December left. So we're hoping to get somewhere around $140,000 gross revenue. Um, our second cabin, we started uh, halfway through the year. We start, started uh, taking bookings uh, June 14th, and we have $83,000 of gross revenue. So in a 12-month period, we actually believe that this property is going to gross about $180,000, and hopefully we could push it to $200,000. Um, you'll see my nightly rates right here. Um, so our first cabin, uh, we're averaging about $532 a night. Um, and our second one is averaging $640, $54 a night. So our, our, our second cabin is a four bedroom, four and a half bath, and it has an indoor pool. And what we find is the indoor pools generate more, um, uh, more income uh, just because the occupancy goes up. I think everyone likes a pool. So this is what a busy month looks like, guys. This, I mean, July was absolutely phenomenal. Our gross revenue was $64,000 and we had a net profit of $34,000. Um, that's just with two. That's why I say with short-term rentals, you don't need that many short-term rentals to get to financial freedom. Now, mind you, that's a busy month. And this is what a graph looks like as far as visitation. And this is what your profits will look like. Right. So July will be your busiest month and then August kind of slows down. October right now, profits are picking back up because the, the leaves are changing colors in the Smokies. And then November, December, you'll get your weekends booked out, but you'll have your holidays like really carry you. And then all of a sudden, January and February are slow where you'll pretty much break even. Uh, you might make a little bit of profit, but then um, once spring break starts, uh, you know, spring break hits, you'll start making money again. So. People ask, what does the monthly expenses look like? Uh, here, my mortgage was $2,100. Property tax, remember, I like areas with low property tax. So it's $385 a month. And actually, we just got the reassessment. I think it actually went down even lower. Uh, insurance was like 85 bucks a month. Um, my cleaning fees, my, my cleaners charged me $175 to clean the property. Um, I charged the guests $215 to, <clears throat> to clean the property. So they pay cleaning fees. So I make money on the cleaning itself. Um, I do have a HOA. It's 230 bucks. Uh, that includes water and sewer. Um, electric bill can it be anywhere from $160 on the low end up to like actually $500. 
Um, I do provide cable and internet. That's about 160 bucks. There's some apps that I have that's like 100 bucks. So all in, really about $4,600 a month. That's my break-even number. And if you remember, like from the last slide, I'm averaging about, I don't know, $560. So really, I need to rent it out about what, eight nights a month for me to just break even. <clears throat> and when you look at your busy months, like July, July, you'll be like 100% booked at a higher rate. So, so how do I self-manage this from 2,100 miles away? So these are the OTAs. When people talk about uh, Airbnb and VRBO, they'll also say, hey, those are the OTAs. So those are the online travel agencies. There's booking.com, Expedia. You can have your own website, and there's actually a lot more that you could uh, publish your listing on. But Airbnb, for me, Airbnb and VRBO, I'm about 50-50 right now. This is actually my listing, new Insta-worthy cabin. Um, what you want to do is you want to have a professional photographer. Don't ever take your iPhone with you. Although, I mean, the iPhone will take good pictures, um, but just spend the money, guys. Spend the money. You're not going to be able to cut your way out of success through short-term rentals. You're going to have to spend more money to make more money. Um, so hire a professional photographer. And there's all of these different, like, tips and tricks where you can like optimize your listing to get higher rates pretty much. Uh, find the right cleaners. Really hiring the right cleaners will solve about 80% of your problems. Once you hire your, the right cleaners, it's almost on autopilot at that point. Uh, you're still going to have to step in. What happens is they'll get your link to your calendar and they know when to clean the, the cabins. They know someone's going to book November. They know a booking's coming November 1st and November 9th. They know it'll come on the 9th. Um, don't skimp on this. I, I see this on the forums all the time. Like, hey, you know what? I have a four bedroom, three bath and someone quoted me $250. What are you guys getting? And people will chime in. Oh, you know, it's too much. You, you know, I'm only um, my cleaner is only charging me 200 bucks. Dude, that's a drop in the bucket. The guests are paying a cleaning fee anyway. And not only that, when you look at it, like, let's say even if you paid $250 and your guests are only paying $200, that's 50 bucks per guest, you'll probably have like 80 guests in a year. So for you to have a cleaner is going to cost you what four grand a year out of pocket. If they're the right cleaner, I would I would pay $10,000. It's no big deal to me, guys. Uh, but really, I, like I said, right now, I'm making money on the cleaning fees. So don't even worry about it. If it's the right cleaner, just spend the money. Okay. Uh, they're your eyes and ears for your property. They're going to let you know when things are wrong. Um, they actually, uh, our last guest, they broke our hot tub cover. They snapped the picture and send it to me right away. We actually send a claim to Airbnb. And actually today we got the, um, we got the email from Airbnb that they resolved our, um, our issue and that they're sending us a $395 check or something like that for the broken hot tub cover. Uh, what's the cleaner's role? So they do a general clean. They do a periodic deep clean. I recommend a deep clean like twice a year to where they'll block off your, your home and like completely do a deep clean for, you know, two days. They'll supply like toiletries. They could supply soap and shampoo, linens. They do trash pickup over there in the Smokies. Um, that way, you, you know, you don't have to put the trash bins out and have a trash man pick it up. Um, they'll change my AC filters once a month. Um, I could ship items to them. Like uh, we had um, our, um, our coffee maker break on us. And so we just bought one on Amazon and shipped it to her. And the best thing is they're a great resource for, for, uh, for the area. Like we had a gas crisis there six months ago. And I was like, hey, how much is gas in the area or where could they get gas? So we were able to tell our guests uh, where to go. Property management software, that's one thing you'll need. Uh, highly recommend it. The one I use is Your Porter. Uh, your Porter is about 27 bucks. It, it gets cheaper with the more listings you get. It'll link your calendars so that way you don't get double bookings. Uh, your Porter is a little notorious for being really slow, so you might get a double booking with them. Um, the automated messages to the right, there's a picture of all these automated messages. So my guests get a, a confirmation message the second they book. Uh, one day before check-in, they get a message. Um, after they check in at noon, they get a message. And then I also send them a text at noon. And then the, the text says, hey, this is your Wi-Fi password. This is your door code. This is where to park. Um, the day after check-in, there's an automatic message that says, hey, everything okay? Just making sure. Uh, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. And then um, the day they check out, 
I'll send them a message like, hey, thank you for staying with us. I uh, hope you had a great stay. Um, that's like one of the biggest things your channel manager is going to do for you is just to um, pretty much control the communication. Once it does this, guests have a better stay. Um, you can outline all your house rules. Um, that way, I know someone that was typing all this shit out. And dude, it's way too much work. It doesn't make any sense, especially for $27 a month. Totally worth it. The one other thing your porter does is it actually uh, will take the guest's phone number, the last four digits of their, uh, digits of their phone number, and it'll create a door code for them. Um, that costs 75 cents every guest. Uh, drop in the bucket, totally worth it. And when guests come in, they just punch in their last four digits of their phone number, and their code's only good from the time they check in to the time they check out. Um, your porter will also give you financials. So that was the screen that I was sharing before. It'll actually update your listing uh, constantly because uh, what will happen is if you update your listing uh, like every day, Airbnb says, hey, this is an actual website, like an uh, active website that someone's uh, constantly putting work in. So it actually ranks you higher in the um, Airbnb algorithm. They have a free website. That website's not very good, but at least you have your own direct booking website. So... Uh, these are automated messages, and this is what it looks like where it'll just automatically insert like the guest name. It'll automatically insert like the date they, che they check in. Um, so those things are really important because it sets expectations, and it's going to save you time and money. This is what a calendar looks like. Uh, what will happen is when someone books, they'll go into my calendar, and it'll actually have their name, and it'll show Airbnb versus VRBO where they book from. Um, and I could make adjustments on here, like I could block off certain days if I wanted to use the property myself or give it to a family member or something like that. So you do have control of your calendar on these channel managers. I use dynamic pricing. So dynamic pricing is pretty much a standard in the, you know, like hospitality industry. So here's a picture of like um, a flight, right? So sometimes you book a flight six months, uh, in advance and it's one price and then you book last minute it's a, it's another price so the goal is how do we get everyone to pay like the highest price so what i use is i i use dynamic pricing and dynamic pricing will adjust the price of your listing depending on like occupancy in the area or demand in the area you could let's say you're you you have no idea of sports and you have a short-term rental in Miami and you have no idea that the super bowl is coming into town but you have your price set at $50 a night when you could have gotten a thousand dollars a night, you know. Um, so dynamic pricing, highly, highly uh, recommend it. I'm recommending your porter. Your porter costs twenty dollars a month. Um, I do have a video in the healthcare professionals uh, Facebook group page that breaks down how to use it, um, and there's tons of tutorials out there on how to use it. So this is what uh, dynamic pricing looks like. Anytime the color changes into blue to dark blue, that means the price will automatically go up. And you can see right here, this is probably June. So this is June, 2021. Um, with my first short-term rental, it was all at $799 a night, like at the peak season. And actually I have it set to where, it's almost like booking a flight last minute to where like if it's still, um, I don't give discounts out there on, on the busy season. I actually set a premium. So when it gets closer to the date, my prices are actually going up. Um, it's like driving a Tesla. It's not meant to be fully automatic. You're still going to need to go over there and just adjust it and tweak it every now and then. But that's one of the automation tools that's going to help you, um, you know, um, focus in on other tasks. Um, I mentioned Wi-Fi door locks earlier. Uh, I'm recommending we use the Schlage Encode. It'll probably cost you 250 bucks. Um, it'll, um, you could control this on your phone. Um, and it connects with your porter to where guests, and, you know, it'll automatically program the guest's phone number. It could store 100 codes on there. Uh, and the one thing is it'll actually have a log. And so the log is extremely important for taxes. And the reason why is uh, if any of you are buying like a short-term rental at the, towards the end of the year, and Ryan will talk about this later um, next week, you want to document your cleaner's times. Because what you want to see is, hey, your cleaner, they'll say, hey, uh, Sherry came in at 10 a.m. and she left at 1130. And I could say, hey, my cleaner was in there for an hour and a half. Or I could say, the cleaner came in at 10 and she left at 10.05. I know she did a crappy job in five minutes, man. 
So, um, but yeah, I could control this over my, uh, my cell phone and I could add um, guest codes. Actually, I had a friend just go over to my cabin today and I gave him a door code and he was able to access it. So this is what the app looks like. The app is actually garbage. Um, there's other apps that are better. Security cameras, I do use a ring floodlight. What I try to do actually is I try to have the same systems in my house. Um, I like to have those systems into um, my short-term rentals. That way I only have one app to open. I don't, I don't wanna have all these different uh, devices. So um, totally normal to have a, a security camera out there. Um, I like to have it in the front. You can't have it pointed at the hot tub over there and you can't have them indoors. So that's just creepy. And try not to watch your cameras, guys is um, it'll drive you nuts if you're trying to, if, and I, I, we're all guilty, like spying in our, on our guests, making sure there's enough people, the right amount of people coming in and what the hell they're doing. So don't do it. Uh, this is actually our second short-term rental. We acquired it May 21st and we went live in June 14th. It actually has an indoor pool. It's three stories with a nice little view. Taking reservations if anyone's interested. Uh, this is actually uh, a picture of the indoor pool. Um, and actually, what's interesting is um, I have a, a third short-term rental being built right now, and it's the same exact floor plan. We purchased it for the, we purchased this second short-term rental uh, for $680,000. Um, there's no way you're getting it at $680,000 anymore. It's probably easily over $900,000. Uh, and the third one we got under contract for $690,000. And it should be built within... They should, they're building it right now. Maybe the next three, four months, they'll, they'll finish up. It's 2,300 square feet, four bedroom, four and a half bath. And the conservative projections is uh, about 150 to $170,000 gross revenue. Um, and we actually have a fourth one. We're partnering with um, a good friend of mine. He, I think he's on the call right now. Um, that should be probably early, early to mid 2020. Uh, and that's also a four bedroom with an indoor pool. And we I actually think it's going to generate the same amount, about $180,000 gross revenue. Um, so lessons learned, I've learned a ton. So number one, get your finances in order well before closing. Um, I actually wound up having to scramble and find a lender that was willing to close within 13 days. And I found it. Um, don't panic. And don't drop prices, especially in the busy seasons. That what you'll see is, oh, I'm not getting any bookings. You know, November is completely blank. And so what someone will do is they'll drop their prices. When you drop your prices, it gets booked right away. And now you have a lower clientele. Um, I mean, I was, I'm cheap as hell. But the thing is, um, like people that are booking for like 100, 200 bucks, they're not, they're generally not the best um, uh, guests and they're going to drive you nuts. Um, you're just going to get messages from them all the time uh doesn't doesn't fail i guess we'll drive you nuts that's just a part of the business um you know i think a lot of times people want the perfect investment they want to put the money down they want to make money and they you know they want zero headaches well the truth is the more work you put into something the more money you're going to make out of it so um that's the thing airbnb and short-term rentals um you're going to make tons of money with it but you have the headaches that come with it are you willing to take those headaches? So um, you're not going to make everyone happy. Um, you'll completely bend over backwards for someone and they'll give you a stupid four-star review or a three-star review. You're like, what the hell, dude? I let you in an hour early, you know? Um, one thing I learned too is guests will value an experience over budget. So if you could provide an amazing experience for them, they will pay for it. Um, and um, now, I think Airbnb is leaning towards that now. If you only need to go on the Airbnb Instagram page and add them, and you'll see exactly what Airbnb wants you to give guests. Like they, you, they want, you know, Airbnb wants you to provide these amazing, like, uh, you know, picturesque places. Um, and the one thing I, I learned too is you're not going to cut your way out of success here. Uh, actually, the more you cut, and if you go cheap on stuff, it's going to bite you in the butt. So spend the money up front. Don't be cheap. These are some amazing Airbnb homes. I show everybody to the left is something called the Fertura home. This thing, uh, it probably cost them $200,000 to build. And it's in Joshua Tree, California. 
he books it out $275 a night and it's solidly booked until November next year. Like a year, a year in advance, completely booked. Because like I said, guest value and experience. Um, this is a, uh, the Kettle Home in Galveston, Texas. It was actually featured on DIY Network, booked a year in advance. Um, an Airstream in Malibu. This thing is amazing. This thing gets like over $1,000 easily a night because of the views and they make everything like Instagrammable. That is their whole focus. And I just wanted to show you guys, it doesn't really have to be anything crazy expensive, but if you could provide people an amazing experience, people will pay for it. Uh, this is also the Hawking House Hills or Cliffs Hawking House Hawking Hills, Ohio. I don't know, I fucked that up. But anyway, it's in Ohio and there's this amazing like waterfall there. Um, he doesn't even put it on Airbnb anymore because there's so many direct bookings. And when you get direct bookings, uh, you don't have to pay, or guests don't have to pay the uh, booking fees, which is usually like 15%. And what you can do is you can actually increase your prices like five, 10%, and you can keep those booking fees for yourself. So, so advice, really don't focus in on price. To me, when I first came into this, I was trying to buy homes like three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars um, $500,000. But I wasn't focusing on the income. See, I think people will focus in on like getting something they're comfortable with, paying $600,000 or whatever they're, they're comfortable paying with. But the thing is, if I told you there's a home that's worth $500,000 that's breaking even, and one that's $700,000 that's generating you like $100,000 profit, I would easily go to the $700,000 home. But a lot of times people don't feel comfortable with going that high. And you have to qualify for it too. Not everyone could you know, qualify for a $700,000 home, but focus more on the income potential, okay, versus, versus the actual price on the home. Uh, network, 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 network. I mean, just try to meet as many other Airbnb hosts as you can, especially in the areas you want to invest in. You want to talk Smoky Mountains? We'll talk Smoky Mountains all day, every day. I could talk all day about Smokies. Uh, there's tons of Facebook groups out there and tons of meetups. Go to meetups, okay? Uh, tons of podcasts out there. Um, and really, the one thing is get out of your bubble. If I were to tell you, or if someone were to tell me that I'd be investing in Tennessee a year and a half ago, I'd be like, Dude, you got to be crazy, man. I don't even know where Tennessee is. You know, I don't even, I never even heard of the Smoky Mountains, but really get out of your bubble, listen to other investors, making money in the space that you want to be in. Um, and it's really not about the amount of units. I think when I first started investing, I said, I'm going to buy one home, then two, then three, then four. Then I'm going to have all of these homes. With Airbnb, man, you only need a handful of homes and you can be financially secure. And so when people ask me all the time, how many homes do you have? I mean, that's kind of, uh, you know, when I tell them, oh, you know, maybe two short-term rentals, but yeah, but look at how much two short-term rentals are making me compared to like having, I could have had 50 homes in Cleveland really, but you know, I don't know. I think some people like seeing how many um, um, units they have, but it's really all about the cash flow. And that's pretty much it. I tried to trim this presentation down as much as I could. So that way I could, um, um, just answer any of your guys' questions. Um, I do want to, um, I want you guys to reach out to me um, if you have any questions. That's actually a QR code and you could scan that and um, it'll add um, my contact to your phone. Um, I'm on Instagram, The Real Alex Avio, and I do have a Facebook group page, um, Healthcare Workers Investing in Real Estate. Um, that's a group I'm trying to grow. Um, and it's really about, I'm, um, you know, I'm not making any money off this. It's more about um, just sharing information and helping others, really. So with that, any questions? Yeah, Alex, real quick, I just want to touch on like three points that I noticed during your presentation that I think could resonate with a lot of people. So that first home you bought, you mentioned that it's set on the market for 40 days. So right. that just goes to show that a lot of people are waiting and waiting and waiting for the right time to buy something to get started in real estate investing. They don't know when to jump in. Is the market going to crash? Housing yeah. prices are insane. And people will always find excuses to not get yeah. started. And Alex, on the other hand, that property was sitting 40 days. Some people mm -hmm. might look at it, they overpass, you know, pass it and look at how much money it's generating for him. So that's yeah. a huge, huge takeaway is really just to take 
your first step. Um, the second point was that you're definitely not afraid to learn. And I think that that's a huge thing in this industry and investing in yep. real estate is you're not going to know it all when you get started. You will not know everything when, when you're just going out and purchasing your first short-term rental. And it just goes to show like Alex has done a great job educating himself. He's using all the amazing resources that are out there. You know, it's 2021. We have the internet. You can download and get a lot of these resources completely for free. You know, yeah. it's not like yeah. an education, a master's degree or a bachelor's degree where you're spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars for it. Like this stuff is for free out there and you can easily digest the uh, information and go out there and you will have to make some mistakes. And then just the third point that I want to touch on is the systems that you built. So as you continue to scale and try and automate and create businesses in real estate, it is so, so important to build systems. And this is leveraged a lot by like technology and different apps and different softwares. And the best way to learn about those things is by networking. So asking people who are in the industry that you want to be in, what technology and apps are they using to scale their portfolio? portfolio or manage their business. And there's a lot of amazing ones out there for free. So um, those are really just three points that I wanted to touch on that I think can resonate with a lot of people, but you did have some questions pop in. So you can go ahead and dive into those. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And that home that sat on the market, I remember my, my real estate agent, she was saying, how much, how much do you want to offer? And I'm like, well, I want to get the home, give me full price. And I think a lot of times people will nickel and dime because they, they want to they want to get the deal they want to say they got the deal you know they're an amazing negotiator because they got it for 620,000 instead of 625,000 and I'm like wait a minute we're leveraging this anyway right so and at the time I was going to put 10% down and um, I remember talking to a buddy about it he said why don't you offer you know $600,000 and I said okay so I could lose the deal and it'll cost I if I get the deal, it'll be $60,000 out of pocket versus 62,500 62, out of pocket. Not worth my time, man. Give me the deal. I'll overpay for it. So, um, but yeah, let's see any of these questions here. Bunch of people from where they're from. Let's see what else. Uh, just starting Airbnb, Galveston. Uh, Anybody else want to jump in with the question while I scroll through this? Let me see. Hey, Alex, man, this is, this is fantastic, man. I, I, I do have a, a question. Just one. Lenny Thank the you. boss, go ahead, man. What you got, Lenny <laughs> the boss? Hey, um, so you know, one of the things here is um about just the, the contact. Do do you normally give? like um, business hours or something, like some type of hours on when they can contact you or you just let them contact you two, three in the morning asking for the Wi-Fi code? Well, my wife is answering those questions, so I let them answer, you know, call. <laughs> no, I'm just messing around. I do have it where it says, hey, contact us from, you know, uh, 10 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but they still gonna, and really we've never had, a. we've had probably three calls in a year. And we, we hang up on them right away, but they still will, you know, because we prefer to have everything messaged on the platform. That way there's like a detailed record of it or whatever uh, in case something, you know, goes south. But yeah, um, for the most part, uh, people aren't contacting you. And uh, when you have those automated messages, um, you know, you give everyone all of the answers. They, they try not to contact you. Oh, thank you. Sure. Who else we got? Uh, hey, Alex. Uh, yeah, quick question. Uh, first time here. Jordan, what's up, man? Hey, Glad you're here. Um, yeah, good to be here. Um, so uh, me and a friend are looking to invest in our first property. We're actually looking out in your area, the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, seems like a good area. Um, uh -huh. So what kind of loans are you using to, to get into these properties? Because I heard you talk about in a YouTube video, uh, you did a uh, vacation home rental. Um, yeah. And then, so I'm curious, I, I can't really find much on Google about those. Is that like a investment loan property? Um, yes. So it's a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac product. Um, it's, um, you could talk to, what you need to do is find the right lender that deals specifically with just short-term rentals. Um, I'll send you, um, or, or text me later. I'll, I'll text you all of my contacts. 
Um, at a certain, so you could buy your first short term rental with 10% down. Um, that is the ideal situation. And if you're like married, what you want to do is if your spouse can, um, what you want to do is put one under your name. And then if you could have your spouse, like put one under their name, that actually works out best versus putting 20% down on one deal. Cause now you're going to be cash flowing double than what you would have had. Um, now there's some caveats to that. Like we can't be like a $30 million home and, you know, I, I only want to put 10% down and there's some rules to it. Like you have to ideally stay in it. Uh, I think two weeks of, uh, in, a, in a year, um, what I'll do is I'll have a lender come in and he'll, he'll, um, he'll kind of break that down. But yeah, that's, that's a very popular product. Um, you just have to find the right lender at a certain point, you're going to max out on debt to income. Um, and so what you want to look for is a DSCR loan. So it's, a, that's a debt service coverage ratio loan, loan. And what it's doing is it's, um, assessing the, the property's ability to cover the loan. Right. So like, let's say you have uh, $3,000 a month mortgage payments. So that's $36,000 a year in mortgage payments. Can the property generate $36,000 a year? And so that winds up being a DSCR coverage ratio of 1.0. And that's actually the magic number. It, they usually look for a one, one to one ratio with that. Um, but yeah, try to get the 10% vacation home loan. But even if you have to put 20% down, these things still make money at 20% down. I made a mistake at putting 18% down and I'm glad I did it. So don't let putting uh, more money down deter you from uh, or stop you from buying that um, short-term rental because you're going to learn a ton and you're just still going to cash flow a ton. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Alex, how are you? Hey, what's going on? Vic from Long Island. Congratulations on like, I see like what the pictures that you showed your properties look amazing at the prices that you got it. Looking at similar things right now, it's like going close to over a million. I mean, so yeah. you really hit it by a knock. I mean, uh, so like if we do buy it at this 1.1, 1 1.2, I, I mean, I kind of personally feel, oh my God, I paid too much, but yeah. You know? Yeah. And focus in on the amount of money. And I'm still looking at 1.2 also. Um, and uh, I look at properties, like my realtor sent me one at 1.2. And now I could tell you three years ago, there's no way I'm looking at 1.2. I was buying homes at $60,000, $80,000. And now you're telling me 1.2, that is insane to me. But when you look at the ability of the property, now my realtor sent me one at 1.2 and it would generate $250,000 gross revenue on the conservative end. The one thing I'll tell you is that there will be a dip here. Like we have a COVID bump, like people are paying crazy amount of money. And so I like to be conservative, like, oh man, I'm going to have a loan for $1.2 million. Um, so will your gross revenue change because of this? To be honest with you, I have no idea. And nobody knows the answer to that because COVID changed everything. You know, we don't know if people are just not going to, you know, people are just going to keep uh, doing road trips. At least that, that's the market that I'm in. I, I'm in drivable destination markets. Now, right now we're generating really good money with 12 and a half million people. Will it go, will my revenue go down if 10 million people are going to be traveling to the Smokies? Probably. But did your property stand out? My properties, that's why I have properties with pools. The pools stand out. It's a business and you have to stand out, stand out, stand out, stand out. So... Hey, Alex, I've got a question. This is Harry. How you Harry, doing? man, how's it going? <laughs> good, good, good. So <laughs> you hooked me up with the STRs last month when we spoke. And so in regards to the price, right, I know you keep mentioning focus on potentials, focus on, it, on its ability to actually uh, generate revenue, right? Yes. I just don't see, I just don't, because properties, when we first start talking, it's, it's um, maybe like about two months ago. Yeah. Properties that, we, that I've been looking at is like, 850 880 at that time right now today as it stands like 1.2 1.4 it, it doesn't yeah you missed the boat and, and, man. you missed you the boat that. <laughs> <laughs> i missed the boat exactly in two months right <laughs> so i don't think the same properties can generate that enough cash flow to match yeah, the yeah. Uh, philosophy of the, the, the increase in prices so it doesn't make yeah. sense for somebody to jump in right yeah. so what's what's your take on that 
yeah, look somewhere else, to be honest with you. To yeah. me, Smokies is the number one market in the area. Yeah. It's pound yeah. for pound. But yeah. the thing is, can if you're not comfortable there, are there other areas? Like I like, I just have two under uh, contract in the Gulf Shores of Alabama. Just because mm-hmm. to be honest with you, 1.2, it, it's scary to me, you, yeah. you know, and and, and I and I know the market, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's definitely other markets, right? Like I drove all the way to uh, um, uh, Phoenix um, last mm-hmm. month mm-hmm. and they're killing it there. Yeah. there. There's tons of different markets out there. That's why I like to do these network meetups because yeah. you, you, you don't know what you don't know. And there's other people making money in yeah. all these different yeah. areas. So exactly. th- this person in in Phoenix, she spent, she bought her home for 480,000, put $40,000 in design into it. And she is mm. booked solid for a year in advance because gotcha. her, her design is absolutely phenomenal. And she generates $180,000 a year. It's because of her oh, design. Wow. Her design is absolutely phenomenal. So there's gotcha. definitely um, other markets out there. Um, will you have to work for it harder? I think so. Cause Smokies, I, dude, I am the average guy. I am average, you know, and the average dude made money and, you know, anybody could have went into the Smokies two, three years ago and they'll, they'll make money and they'll of look course. like a genius, you know? Of course. And so now it's getting more difficult. Like we're it having is. to separate ourselves it is. and it is. really the better investors are, um, you know, standing out. So it is, it is. Yeah. But I'm just afraid that, you know, they're building new construction in the same, in the subdivision where they have like 60 cabins, 70 cabins. Right. Yeah. So you'll be competing with those people that bought like two years ago that yeah. and, and paid like 600 K and now yeah. you're paying 1.4. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a fair point. But what I could tell yeah. you is if you visit the area, there's so many damn people. It's like being yeah. in Disneyland. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was there like two weeks ago. Yeah. Right. It's right. Packed. It's packed. The, yeah. it, it's completely packed. It's a supply yeah. and demand issue and you're still going to make money. Will you generate as much revenue? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. But I mean, are you still happy with like generating, you know, 20 to 25% cash on cash return versus mm-hmm. getting 50% cash on cash return? Mm-hmm. Um, and really, where are you going to put your money? I mean, you're going to put it in long term rentals? Or are they generating just, you know, yeah, LTR, uh, that much LTR money? cannot be compared with SDR. Yeah, I agree with you. Right. Yeah. Unless mm-hmm. the, the only thing I could see is uh, multifamily syndication, where you did a heavy uh, value add. Yeah. And you're pretty much doing a burr on an apartment complex and Correct. you bought something at 2 million and then now it's worth yeah. $4 million and you're cashing out or refinancing. Yeah. So. Even with syndication, you have to be the GP to actually killing it. <laughs> right. If you're, an, if you're an LP, you're just basically just yeah. like owning an LTR. Yeah. Well, don't shit on the uh, um, uh, uh, LPs because I want to be an LP. I want this active money to, <laughs> I want to funnel this money into uh, more passive income. Sure. I mean, uh, that, that, that is my goal. Cause I, that's my end goal too. Yeah. Right. The absolutely. whole point of real estate investing is to just have more time freedom and to mm-hmm. be LP. Um, that is actually the most ideal for me. So it is, it is. Yeah. That's the end goal for me too. Yep. Right. All right, cool. Thank you. Maybe we'll take like three questions. We're running at seven o'clock here. Anyone else got questions? Hey, hey Alex. Alex. Just check. how are you? Chuck, dude, you just messaged me. What's up, man? I can't believe I'm speaking to you. <laughs> no, how's it going, man? How's hey, it going? Uh, quick question. You may or may not know the answer to this, but I figure you probably would. Um, you know, let's just say for realistic numbers from a cost segregation uh, perspective, um, be our first short term rental. Um, it's looking like it's going to generate around 180000 in revenue a year. Um, how would that affect our taxes for the first year? Well, well, I would probably defer to Ryan Beck, who's going to be here next um, next week, because um, I am with me. I try to find people way smarter than me, and there's a lot of people way smarter than me. Um, so with me, the first short-term rental gave me a two hundred seven thousand dollar deduction year one, which completely offset my my taxes. And so now that property generated $130,000 of gross revenue. And so that's $130,000 more income that I have coming in. Now I have to buy like two properties. And that's kind of why I'm in, I'm in contract in Gulf Shores. So I need to have at least $400,000 in cost segregation, like um, with bonus depreciation to help offset all of my income. So. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, I'm assuming, and I have no idea, and you may not know this either, but if you have to furnish the home, because this one will not come furnished, can you write that off on your taxes? 
Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's um, bonus depreciation. It's any anything that you're having to put into the business for it to be successful. Gotcha. All right, sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? This, hey, Alex, man. More. Quick question. Kush, what's up, man? How's the hey, hospital going? Up good. There? Finally, get a break. I'm wearing a shirt of favorite RT. Got me. Five oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. You mentioned the Gulf Shores, so I'm looking to pull the trigger around March and looking at markets, thinking about a beach market because my partner likes it. My wife likes the beach. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the drop in occupancy in the winter? That's the one thing that like is getting us is the Smokies yeah. all year round versus yeah. that drop off. Yeah, you get to use it, baby. Go to the beach in the yeah. winter, man. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So yeah. I, I get it. And I know people there that are crushing it during all seasons, too. Um, I'll send you a link. Um, we talked with a realtor out there. Um, her name is Deb Wood. And she talked about the market. And she said pretty much you'll be slow like November, December time. Um, and then maybe January and February, you could rent to Snowbird if you wanted to. But she says she tends to not do that anymore just because um, the, the visitation in the Gulf Shores has been going up and they're actually expanding the airport. And like I said, COVID's changed everything. And now the weekends are getting booked to the point where, you know, she gets one or two weekends, maybe three weekends, she makes more than like your midterm rental market occupancy, like with the snowbird. So I don't worry about it. When I look at people's seasons, you have like a hundred uh, days of summer and you just need to kill it during those hundred days of summer. And then you're going to have spring break and then you're going to have Thanksgiving. And then you'll have the, the day after Christmas to New Year's day. And it just so happens that most likely it'll be January 2nd this year. So, but yeah, I mean, that's primarily why I chose the beach market. It's kind of like a bucket list thing with me and I'll get to enjoy the beach like during the slow yeah. season. So, well, we're actually thinking about Tampa cause he's out there, but I don't know if there's enough of a cleaner network, but that's something that I think I need to explore. Cause it's not like the big markets we see, but it's, it's growing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I've definitely, um, gone to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to get it and figure it out later. Because we put in a home, uh, an offer on a home in uh, Port St. Joe. And Port St. Joe is a sleepy town. When I hear sleepy, I'm like, oh, no, that you know that you never want to hear sleepy because that means low right. demand, right? And so um, I jumped in and, and then I was like, okay, I'll figure out the cleaners later. But and, and actually I did. And then I my offer got rejected for a cash yeah. offer, but there's, they're definitely out there. Have you looked into turnover BNB? Turnover BNB has been pretty cool, like where you could find cleaners. So. Yeah, I remember somebody mentioning that. I don't know if you've used it personally, but mm -hmm. it's got, it looks yeah. pretty promising. Yeah, I use turnover BNB um, and my cleaners, like it, it's like an automation tool because my cleaners have my calendar and they, like when I get the booking, they hit accept. And I know, okay, I know that cleaner is going to go there. And not only that, it will pay them. Once they're done, they hit complete and it pays them automatically. So where I don't have to like send them a monthly bill anymore. Um, but the thing is, if I couldn't find a cleaner, there's a feature on there where it says find cleaner and you could list it like, hey, anyone want to clean this cabin for 180 bucks or something like that? And you'll get a lot of bids. So Great. Yeah. Got it. thank you. Sure. No problem. All right. Who else we got? Maybe one last question. Hey, Alex, this is you. Uh, we spoke before in the past. You, what's up, man? How's it going? Good, how are you? From um, Arizona, my, uh, Florida, right? From Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I right. wanted to ask um, how you go about kind of analyzing uh, the markets you want to invest in. Yeah, um, it's a relationship business, really. It's, it's who, not how. Um, it's about getting out there and asking other people what they're doing. Um, cause my philosophy is I could go in there and I just need to outwork anyone, everyone else. And how much is our people making? It, it's like Gulf Shores was way, way difficult. Cause when I analyze all of the metrics, the metrics was telling me, no, don't invest in the area. Cause when you go on air DNA, a vast majority of the rentals out there were on property management and their numbers were garbage. And then I could look at their listings and they're all getting like three star reviews and I'm like, I could do better than a three-star review. I'm a four-star guy, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, I wind up looking on AirDNA and I wind up finding, a, um, I click on a listing and it's a one-bedroom condo. And I look at the picture. I'm like, dude, I know that guy. 
And so I reached out to him. His name is Tim. And I said, Tim, you got to talk to me about this market. How are you doing? And he says, dude, my one bedroom in that location, I bought it for $350,000 and I'm generating $55,000. I said, cool, because I know what kind of host he is. He's an amazing host. Um, and he, you know, he has great communication, great marketing. And, and I would apply the same exact thing. And the home, the, the condo that we were purchasing was a three bedroom for $440,000 right next door. And so I know if he's doing like $55,000 and he was closed January until uh, March. He was closed January to March and he still generated $55,000. I know that if he's next door with one bedroom, I could easily do $80,000. And so that's why we felt comfortable pulling the trigger on that. It's really about going out there and talking to other investors. Hopefully they share numbers like I do. Um, and then can you stand out above all those others? So. Gotcha. Thanks for sharing. All right, guys. I think that is it. Seven o'clock. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you. At one point, I saw we had 91 people on the call. Uh, short-term rentals is hot. Everybody wants to talk about short-term rentals. So thanks, everyone, for... Uh, showing up. Um, next week, we have a really good meetup. Uh, we're going to talk about taxes and how we could save money on taxes. And, and Ryan will be here. If you guys go to the chat, click on those three dots and then hit save chat. Okay. So those three dots and hit save chat. So that way, if there's any like email addresses that you're, you know, someone posted, uh, you could have a, you know, a list or if there's any other questions there. So. Hey, Alex, I, sorry, I will super late because I'm central hour and I okay. will like sure. two hours early before and then now okay. I'm late. Okay. Anyways, um, I don't know if you already mentioned that, but I wonder how passive it is to do Airbnb. I don't know if you already mentioned this. It's not very passive. <laughs> if, yeah. you're, if, if you're going in there thinking it's going to be passive, you're going to be very disappointed. Um, maybe the best thing is if you're busy is maybe partner with someone and maybe they can be the hustle and then you be the money person or something like that. I know a lot of people that are doing it that way. Um, there are definitely apps out there that help automate a lot of this. But, um, you know, if you're not met, uh, like being responsive to a guest or what if you have a flood going on or something crazy, you know, you need to be able to get a handyman in there right away. Um, yeah. Those are like your worst case scenarios, which I mean, knock on wood, that hasn't happened. Uh, but you need to be responsive to your guests. There's definitely like... Like I think Smart BNB or which is called Hospitable now will actually answer your guest questions for you sometimes. Um, that it has like artificial in intelligence there, uh, but it this is a people business, you know. Do you, okay? Do you have an estimate how much time you spend on it for your first um, property? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like so really, like few months like five, 10 minutes a day. And really I was obsessing with it more so. And it's not really the, the amount of time, but it's just, you know, every now and then it's, you know, 8.30 at night and you need to send a, a text that takes you, you know, uh, 10 seconds or something like that. And then now I'm actually in the process, process of hiring a virtual assistant. So okay. we're going to take even more work off our plate. And then I hired a bookkeeper. So it takes even more work off your plate. So once you get the ball rolling and start generating money, like I said, the, um, if um, you have enough money to solve a problem, you don't have a problem. These things generate enough money where you could hire a bookkeeper, you could hire a virtual assistant to where it takes um, that off your plate. I don't think you could be completely hands-off, um, but... You know, if you do, it's less money out of your pocket in your pocket because you're yeah. hiring more and more people. So, yes, because I was thinking about how competitive it is in the Smoky Mountain area. And if you mentioned 20 to 25 percent cash on cash return compared to a uh, seven to 10 percent S&P 500 without doing anything. So I'm trying to think how passive it is. So yeah. if the work really worth it, then, of course, um, short term rental is really promising. But yeah. thank you so much. Sure. All right, guys, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Hope to see you guys next week. If you know anyone that uh, wants to learn about real estate that's in the medical community, shoot them my way. Hopefully they could join our Facebook group. I'm trying to get it above 1,000 people. So with that, I'll see you guys. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys.